Hello everyone. We're going to end this microbe mania module with a little introduction to kingdom fungi. Now kingdom fungi include organisms like mushrooms, like you see in this picture, and mold, and little unicellular fungi are called yeast. So if you know anybody who micro brews, they would need yeast uh, to help brew their beer. And fungi also include a lot of weird plant diseases called things like rust. I mean, it actually look like, looks like rust on a plant or smuts or blights. So a blight upon your house. Okay, that, that would be you're wishing a fungal infection upon someone's house. So let's explore this kingdom a little bit. So first, let's answer the question, where are we? Again, we're following up in Unit 2 from Unit 1, which was the theory of evolution that says all life originated from a single common ancestor. So in this diagram, you can see this clearly um, demarks the three domains of light, life. There's domain bacteria, which we talked a lot about in Chapter 27. Then there's domain archaea, which we talked a, a little bit about in Chapter 27. And hopefully you recall that both bacteria and archaea are comprised of solely of prokaryotic cells. So now we finally make our segue into domain eukarya. And in this domain, all the organisms have cells that are eukaryotic, thus the name, and all the cells have a nucleus. Now, it just looks like little twigs on the branch of life, but here we have the animal kingdom, the fungal kingdom, and the plant kingdom. So all of these other eukaryotes are very simple. Most of them are single-celled eukaryotes. And because these are the organisms that we collectively call protist, and because the single-celled eukaryotes have been on Earth longest, they have been evolving the longest, and thus diversifying the longest. So there's a lot of eukaryotes that are simply single-celled organisms or very simple organisms like slime molds. All right, so this is one representation um, of the tree of life. Here's another one. I, I like to use a lot of different models. Again, these are just all models, ways of picturing life on Earth. So what's good and what's not good about this diagram? Why don't you just take a second and look at it? What do you think I'm going to like and what do you think I'm going to not like? Well, one thing that I like is it clearly shows the three kingdoms of life that are still kingdoms, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the fun fungi kingdom. And it also clearly shows that plants, animals, and fungi evolved from what we used to call protist, simple eukaryotic cells. Now, what I don't like about this is they still call they, they still use the term eubacteria. This was only popular actually for a few years using the term eubacteria and archaeobacteria. And then the microbiologists put their foot down and said, no, archaea are not bacteria. Bacteria are bacteria and archaea aren't. There are two domains of prokaryotic cells. One we call bacteria, one we call archaea. So again, bacteria are all unicellular and all prokary prokaryotic. Archaea are also all unicellular and all prokaryotic. Um, this used to be a kingdom, kingdom protista, which I always knew ever since I started teaching years and years ago that this was a sort of a dumb kingdom, a junk drawer kingdom, because anything that was a eukaryote that wasn't a plant, an animal, or a fungus, we just said, oh, it's a protist. At any rate, we still informally use this term protist for simple eukaryotic organisms, but we no longer consider it a kingdom. All right. What about this diagram? <laughs> what do you think I'm going to like and not like about this diagram? Why don't you take a moment? Okay, what I like about this, it even more clearly shows the evolutionary relationships between plants, fungi, and animals with protist. So these group of organisms that we collectively call protist, these are all simple eukaryotes. Some lineages evolved into plants, some lineages evolved into fungi and some lineages evolved into animals. So I, I like this one a lot. Um, what's obviously not correct is they're grouping all the prokaryotes into kingdom Monera and we no longer consider all prokaryotes to be in one kingdom called Monera. Now the one thing that I will point out to you, um, this is sort of small, um, so I don't know if you can read this, but these three kingdoms, plants, animals, and fungi, they're all made up of organisms that are multicellular. In other words, they're made up of more than one cells, and 
the cells are eukaryotic. So in other words, there are three kingdoms of multicellular eukaryotic organisms, plants, animals, and fungi. And if you would walk into the woods and find a new organism that was a multicellular eukaryote, well, how would you know how to classify it? How would you know whether it's a plant, animal, or fungi? Well, we group these organisms by their mode of nutrition. So here, this line here says photosynthesis. So the multicellular organisms that make their own food by photosynthesis, we call plants. The multicellular, that you, um, <laughs> multicellular eukaryotes that absorb their food we call fungi, and the ones that ingest their food, we call animals. If you ever took a philosophy class, maybe you heard of Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. Well, the Dylan version is paraphrasing that. I eat, therefore I am an animal, because there you go. That's the biological definition of an animal. If you are a multicellular uh, eukaryotic organism that eats, you are an animal. Finally, we're going to show one more. I, I like this one too. <laughs> See, Professor D likes this one because it reminds us that, you know, life is just not so neat as these other diagrams um, try to indicate. This reminds us of that concept of endosymbiotic theory. It reminds us that um, a long time ago, some bacteria, specifically some cyanobacteria, were captured by eukaryotes, and uh, these captured cyanobacteria is what we call today or what we call chloroplast. These are the organ of photosynthesis. So remember cyanobacteria were the original photosynthesizers on planet Earth. And I guess you could argue they're still the only photosynthesizers on planet Earth because even though we say, oh, plants photosynthesize, well, their organ of, organelle of photosynthesis is um, are the chloroplast. And the chloroplast, we believe, all the evidence points that they are really little captured cyanobacteria cells. They even have their own DNA. And it also shows somewhere along the evolutionary history that um, a kind of purple bacteria were captured by um, the ancestor of really all modern eukaryotic cells, and these became the mitochondria, the powerhouse. So that's what I like about this, this diagram. But on we go, back to fungi. So again, fungi include mushrooms, like you see pictured here, Mold, which you might find on a moldy orange in your refrigerator or a moldy piece of bread. Yeast, which are used in the brewing and baking industries. And pl other plant diseases like rust and smuts and blights. All right, so once again, remember fungi. They are all eukaryotic organisms, so their cells do have a nucleus. All right, kingdom fungi is very underappreciated. They are very diverse. Here's some really cool pictures of different um, um, fungi. Uh, let's see, these are morels that are highly prized um, by mushroom hunters. Um, these are really fun. These are puffballs and these are they're releasing their spores in this diagram. You give them a little gentle nudge and poof, they puff and they literally release a trillion spores at once. Now we already did the calculations. Remember to be a billion seconds old you have to be almost 33 years old. So to be a trillion seconds old, you have to be over 32,000 years old. All right, so a trillion seconds is a long time, and a trillion spores being released at once, that's pretty darn efficient. All right, but the point of this um, lecture is I want to make sure you understand what are some key characteristics shared by all fungi, no matter how diverse they look. All right, I really already went over these, but we'll do it again. We typically we say fungi are multicellular because they're in the king, one of the three kingdoms of multicellular U organisms. But there's an exception to almost everything in biology. So I said, well, usually there are one-celled fungi, which hopefully you remember are called yeast. Um, they are eukaryotic and they're heterotrophs. They are other feeding. Um, they cannot make their own food like plants. They have to get their carbon, their organic molecules from another source. However, fungi do not ingest their food like we do. How do they obtain their nutrition? Do you remember? By absorption. So let's review this. This is what fungi do. They secrete what we call hydrolytic enzymes. And these hydrolytic enzymes break down these complex organic molecules and then they absorb the monomers into their body. All right, let's break this down a little bit. <laughs> um, 
or or when you um, digest your food, right? When you take some food into your body, you just can't use a whole hunk of protein. You have to digest it, all right, into smaller pieces, into building blocks. In fact, the building blocks of proteins are called amino acids. All right, um, the process by which large biological molecules are broken down into smaller molecules is called hydrolysis. There's the word right there. So hydrolysis, and this is true always, 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 always in biology. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a plant, an animal, a bacteria, a fun, fungi. Whenever in biology we have a large biological molecule and we want to break it down into its building blocks, we, we, we meaning organisms, use the process called hydrolysis. Again, if you care, you can fake your way through a lot of biology. Hydro means water, always. Hydro means water. Lysis means to split. This literally means to split with water. So that's how biological organisms break down big molecules into little molecules by um, splitting the big molecules with water. However, no chemical reaction in living organisms really happen spontaneously. All right, all the chemical reactions in our body have to be catalyzed by these protein helper molecules called enzymes. So um, you've heard of digestive enzymes in your body. Well, digestive enzymes can also be called hydrolytic enzymes. Um, again, because they do hydrolysis. This is just the adjective form. So um, let's say a fungi, just like bacteria, are typically the decomposers in nature. So let's say a fungi is around a dead leaf, all right, full of organic molecules like cellulose. The fungi release their hydrolytic enzymes. It will break down the cellulose into simple molecules like glucose. Glucose is the monomer of cellulose, and then the fungi will absorb the monomer in this example, glucose. So again, um, by complex molecules, we mean the organic molecules of life, proteins, carbs, lipids, DNA, and monomers is another name for building blocks. All right, now where do you find hydrolytic enzymes in your body? All right, I sort of gave you this answer, but I just it's important, so I want to review it with you. Um, you find hydrolytic enzymes in your stomach and your small intestine. What purpose do they serve? Digestion. Because again, another name for digestion in biology is hydrolysis. So when you digest your food, you are hydrolyzing your food. Um, and in order to hydrolyze your food, you need these hydrolytic enzymes to break your food. Wow, I certainly didn't mean to do that. Um, Oh, I just went down a page, sorry. Um, when you digest your food, you're breaking the big complex organic molecules into their building blocks. So in your body, you have a big protein molecule, for instance. Should we draw a little protein molecule here? Maybe that might help some people. So hopefully in your review from unit one, you recall that proteins are monomers of amino acids. I lied. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. So if I had a great big chain of amino acids, the whole thing could be called a protein. And each building block is an amino acid. So the protein is my large molecule, and the building block, or the monomer, is an amino acid. Well, you just cannot take a huge protein into your body and incorporate it into your own body. You have to digest it. Digest it always means break it da back down into the building blocks, the monomers. And the process you use to break down the large biological molecule into smaller pieces is called, once again, hydrolysis. All right, and then these individual building blocks are absorbed from your gut into your bloodstream. So all this process of digestion would be happening in your gut, in your intestine, and then when the protein is broken down into the little building blocks. It's absorbed into your bloodstream. All right, this is very similar to what happens in the fungi. However, these enzymes are not found in the, the fungi's digestive tract. They don't have it. The fungi, if you wanted to draw a little mushroom here, and this is not going to be very accurate, squirts the enzymes into its environment. It breaks down the protein into the building blocks. 
outside its body and then they're absorbed into the body. Okay? So, moral of the story, you digest your food inside your body, the fungi digest its food outside its body, and then absorbs it. And I know I went into a lot of detail, but not everybody's had Bio 151. All right, the most conspicuous part of fungi is often a reproductive structure called a fruiting body. So I said before, this was a ring of mushrooms, all right? This is a little phenomenon called a fairy wing, but actually this is not really the mushroom. This is just the reproductive structure of the mushroom. The, um, the real organism, the real fungus, as we'll see in a minute, is found in all these little strands underneath the ground. They are invisible to this boy because they are underneath the ground, and I just can't even draw enough of them. It's a gazillion of them. So what we call the mushroom is actually just the reproductive structure. The true organism is underground. So let's take a little peek. So here you have it. The, what we call the mushroom is just the reproductive structure, and the actual fungus is underground. And this is the body of a fungus. It's made of these very, very, very thin strands, the very thin tubules. And each tubule, each strand, is called a hyphae. But collectively, all the hyphae are known as the mycelium. And the mycelium is the real fungus. So again, we say, oh, look, there's a fungus. Here's a mushroom. This is just the fungus's reproductive structure. The true organism is the mycelium that's underneath the ground. And again, maybe you've walked through the woods and you've seen an old dead log and you see all these tiny, tiny little white strands. Well, that's the organism. That's the fungus that is working on decaying that log. And again, if you look at the scale here, this is 20 microns right here. You can see how very, very thin these little tubules are that make up the actual fungus. All right, so more on the basic structure morphology of a, a fungus, fun Fungi structure, I just went over this. Each individual filament is called the hyphae, and collectively, all the hyphae are called the mycelium. Now, what we want to investigate is the question, how is the mycelium adapted for absorption? I mean, it better be adapted to absorption. That is how the fungus gets its nutrition, through absor absorption. All right, well, I think I've already alluded to this, all right, but I think you can figure out by looking at it the mycelium has a very, very, very high surface area to volume ratio. And so all that surface area allows um, for greater absorption rates. Um, you whenever you need to have absorption, you find a high surface area to volume ratio. If you look inside your own intestines, that's a lovely thought, right? You see that there's all these little um, villi in your intestines that increase the surface so your food would be here and you have to absorb it so the villi all right increase the surface area of your own intestines all right so we're going to look at this a little bit more closely once again the fungi is made up of hyphae which are collectively called mycelium now the cell walls of a fungus are composed of chitin remember this word looks like chitin but it's pronounced chitin so let's do a little review right here with just covered bacteria, bacteria cell walls are made out of what? Did you think peptidoglycan? If so, you were right, yay. What about plant cell walls? They are made of, did you think cellulose? If so, you're right again. And finally, fungal cell walls are made out of chitin. Let's take a closer look. This is sort of, sort of FYI. I don't really care if you know this or not, but, um, Chitin and both chitin and cellulose are polymers of glucose. In other words, glucose glucose molecules are the building blocks of both cellulose and chitin. And again, in biology, we use the word monomer to mean building blocks. All right, so this could represent part of a cellulose molecule, but there's this little side group here this N-acetyl group. All right, again, you do not need to know the name. But basically, um, in every other um, glucose molecule is flipped upside down. The way that chitin differs from cellulose is there's a little bit of nitrogen here, a little bit of nitrogen here, a little bit of nitrogen there. You don't find any nitrogen in cellulose. So the moral of this story is, even though chitin and cellulose are very similar, they're also different. 
That's just sort of an FYI for people who want to understand it at a slightly deeper level. All right, let's go back to this issue of hyphae and absorption. Um, some hyphae are what we call septate hyphae, and these septate are these cell walls here. And again, as it says right here, the septa divide the hyphae into cells. But this, the cell walls in the fungus, they have an opening here called a pore, and that allows the cytoplasm to flow from cell to cell. All right, so here's an example of a septate hyphae. All right, now, as we, I just said, sept, the septa divide the hyphae into cells, and the pores allow for um, cytoplasmic movement between cells. But some hyphae don't even bother with partial walls. It's like if you're going to have cytoplasmic movement, why have walls at all? And why is this not page downy? There we go. These uh, hyphae are called cyanocytic. Um, cyanocytic. So here you go. Here is an example of a cyanocytic hyphae. Notice there's no cell wall. Well, there's that cell wall around the hyphae, but there's no cell walls between the nucleus dividing it into other cells. So no, they, they shouldn't be there. So what you have is basically a multinucleated cell. So one thing that you're going to have to review for next week is the whole process of mitosis. So mitosis refers to one nucleus duplicating itself exactly, and you end up with two nucleus, nuclei, I should say. Now typically after you divide the nuclei, by mitosis, you also divide the cell in two by a process called cytokinesis. So to get the cyanocytic hyphae, you looks like we've had lots of examples of mitosis, the nucleus duplicated itself, but this the cell did not divide to form two cells. So there was mitosis without cytokinesis. All right, so let's look at this. We're going to play a little game. Can you identify which is the cyanocytic hyphae and which is the septate hyphae? So let's call this fungal fungus A and this fungus B. So which of these two represent the cyanocytic hyphae? Hopefully you're saying B. This is a cool picture and these are all the little nuclei in the hyphae and notice there's no cell walls that separates one nucleus from another. And which is the septate hyphae? Well that would be this one. This clearly shows the cell walls um, dividing the hyphae and compartmentalizing the hyphae. All right, so let's see if uh, I've made the whole point of these characteristics clear. I want you to think for a moment and think of two ways that the structure of the fungus, in other words, the fungal morphology, promotes absorption. All right, so it's very important in biology, we see this constantly, that the structure of a of an organ or organism is related to its function. So what is it? A, there's two ways that we've discussed that the structure of a fungus promotes absorption. All right, I already told you one. One is that they have a huge surface area to volume ratio. I mean, think about it. If you had same All right. If you had a smaller surface area to volume ratio and your, your method of nutrition absorption, you probably could not get monomers diffusing all the way. Ah, I'm trying to make dots. And it's not all right. The point is you probably could not have diffusion all the way to the middle of the organism. But with, hyphae, uh, with the hyphae, there's a great surface area to volume ratio. So because the nutrients diffuse in from all sorts of angles, every part of the organism will be able to get its nutrition. All right, now let's go back to this. Whether you have a cyanocytic or septate hyphae, you have streaming cytoplasm, and that's really important. So let's say there is a piece of food right up here. There's a hunk of dead animal or plant that needs to be digested. So what happens is the fungus will secrete its hydrolytic enzymes, and it will digest this food, right? essentially chop it up into little pieces. Again, this happens outside the fungal body as opposed to inside your own body. The monomers, these little building blocks, will be absorbed into the fungal's body. And it doesn't matter if there's food here, but not food right down here. 
because with this um, septate hyphae with pores, the, these food through the cytoplasmic streaming can travel all the way over here to the part, the cells of the organisms that are not exposed to food. All right, and that's even more efficient in the, um, uh, so we just did the septate hyphae. That's even more efficient with the cyanocytic hyphae. So if there's food here, it's chopped up and absorbed, it can flow to other parts of the fungal. So the large surface area to volume ratio and the structure of the hyphae that allow the cytoplasmic streaming is very, very well adapted for life as an organism where your mode of nutrition is absorption. So that is your introduction to fungi. I talked about fungi nutrition because we had already talked about bacteria nutrition. What we're going to look at next is the sex life of fungi when I come back to fungi. But before that, we're going to talk about the sex life of plants and maybe even of humans. So um, I hope you enjoyed your introduction to fungi. I hope you had a little fun. And now that you've been exposed to bacteria and viruses and fungi, well, not exposed physically, of course, uh, you get to start preparing for a little quiz on them. I'll see you later. Bye.